Hey Liam, you said that thing was a, a shadow demon? That's right, Liam said. A shadow demon. I if I may ask, Olin anxiously licked his lips, what was it doing inside of me? What else would it be doing there? The youth looked up at him curiously, it was feeding on the darkness of your soul. The darkness of his soul? But where had it come from? Had it always been there, or had it entered him unnoticed at some point? No, it was from back then. While I was in that dark place. They didn't just hang me up to be eaten by those damn things, they planted a seed of evil inside of me. He had been plunged into an animalistic delirium during their baptism. They kept healing him, regrowing his flesh as he was continually being eaten alive. Who knew what else they might have done to him at that time? Are you all right? Liam asked. Of course not. This kid has to be fucking with me. I'm fine, Olin answered with a smile. Is there anything else I can do for you before I leave you for the night? I'm still hungry. I'll have the chef fix up, that's not what I mean. I'm hungry. Liam's amber eyes seemed to shimmer as he stared at him intently. Olin took a step back. The shadow demon won't be back until morning, Liam's form seemed to darken and grow opaque. Why don't you stay for the night? W.H. What are you talking Abu? A shadowy claw shot forward and jammed itself into his mouth. Olin gagged and grabbed the dark appendage with both hands, but he couldn't stop it from slowly forcing its way down his throat. Through his tear-blurred vision, he saw Liam's mouth widen into a glowing yellow gash as he grinned evilly in the gloom. Olin's eyes popped open. He threw back his covers as he sat bolt upright in his bed. Fuck! He screamed, what in the fuck was that? The darkness offered no answer. He stumbled toward the sliver of light at the foot of his bed, throwing the room's shutters open. It was barely morning. He shivered as a cool gust of morning air blew in and drove out the stale air of the inn. Olin took a deep breath, then coughed uncontrollably at the all-too-vivid memory of a claw forcing its way down his throat. Olin reached for a nearby pitcher of water and rinsed out his mouth with a cup of water. It wasn't good to start an important day with a nightmare, but the world would hardly care about his complaints. After getting dressed and gathering his things, he went downstairs to see what was happening. A chorus of snores greeted him as he entered the tavern. Reed and his men were sprawled everywhere, their faces displaying various expressions of drunken contentment. Apparently, he had been the only one suffering from nightmares. He kicked the row of chairs that Reed had lined up into a makeshift bed. The woodsman jerked, but his snores resumed a few seconds later. Olin kicked him in the arm, Reed. HGN? It's morning. Who's watching Liam? Liam? Dunno. Olin clicked his tongue in disgust. That was the problem with having important guests. The syndicate usually became more open-handed to accommodate those guests, but everyone attached to them took advantage of it. He gave up trying to get any information out of Reed's gang and made his way to the kitchen. There, he found the barmaid from the previous evening, emptying buckets of water into a barrel near the back. Olivia, Olin asked, have you seen Liam? The barmaid didn't immediately reply. She finished emptying her buckets before moving over to the oven. He came down before dawn, Olivia said as she warmed her pale hands. I honestly don't know what a nice boy like him is doing with the likes of you. Don't start that with me now. And when should I? The only time you show your face around here nowadays is to ruin more people's lives. Olin turned away. He had no time to waste with women who didn't know what they were talking about. My pa's still looking to split your head with his axe for what you did to Broly. He turned to face the woman again. Broly made his choice, Olin grated. He said you had his back, Olivia spat. We all know what that means now. Olin stormed out of the tavern, his mood gone from bad to worse. No matter how many times he saw it, he couldn't get over how unbelievably provincial these people were. It wasn't just in the Azalizian marches, but everywhere out in the country. They all thought like a bunch of naive children, believing fellow villagers were as good as kin and a man's word was his bond. In the end, 
all they could do was cry over imagined injustices when reality paid them a visit. Out on the high street, most of the town's businesses were already busy preparing for the day. Smoke rose from a score of chimneys as finery forges were stocked with charcoal and the ring of hammers on metal chimed up and down the road. Olin found Liam watching a blacksmith work at one of the town's more prominent workshops. He straightened his coat, eyeing the shadows warily as he walked up to the youth. See something you like? Olin asked. I was wondering if they work with mithril. There are mithril mines around here, right? Olin snorted at the youth's sense of excitement. Mithril or is sent straight to the city, he told Liam. Only artisans with an exclusive license from House Bloomrush are allowed to refine and forge mithril. If you want, I could introduce you to a few of them once we get there. I was just curious, Liam replied. The town I grew up in didn't have anything fancy. Which town are you from, if I might ask? Facet Town, on the western border of E. Rantle. I've heard of it, Olin said. Never been there, though. Liam peered at him for a moment before turning his attention back to the blacksmith. Olin couldn't shake the feeling that he had just dodged a quarrel. Was Liam mad about something? Maybe Olin's plotting had been reported. Since it was in E. Rantle and sat right on the King's Road, Facet Town was in a pretty good situation compared to other towns in Riestai's. Of course, the Eight Fingers held some influence there, but the level of exposure that the town had limited them to a handful of rural activities. How did someone from Facet Town get a job like yours? Olin asked. I went to school in E. Rantle. Liam answered. After I learned how to read and write, I received a recommendation from my guardian. I see. He didn't. Liam's words didn't make a lick of sense. School. Guardian? Recommendation? What sort of guardian would send a kid to that den of monsters? They wandered about for another hour before Olin suggested that they head to the wharf. To his relief, Reed and his gang had dragged themselves from the tavern to the pier. Adorned in brigandine and armed with longbows, they made a show of vigilance as Liam waved in greeting. Morning. Hey Liam, Reed raised a hand in response. You look well rested. It was a quiet night, Liam replied. Quiet, eh? Reed rubbed his chin, then leaned over to elbow the youth in the ribs, should have taken a girl to bed with you. We own this town, so no one'd refuse. Is that something you do? Liam asked. Me? Reed laughed as he rubbed the back of his head, nor. Only special guests like yourself get that sort of treatment from Hilmer's gang. Olin sat on a nearby crate, watching and listening as more men gathered around the Sorcerer's Kingdom's agent to make small talk. Was sending women to please Liam an option? He had to get on his good side to increase his chances of building up favor with Lady Albedo. It didn't take long for the men to start getting too chummy with the boy. Olin rose to his feet, dusting off his pants as he went to join the group gathered on the wharf. We ready to get out of here? He asked. Ships set to sail, Reed answered. Does Countess Beaumont know we're coming? Olin snorted. Does it matter? Does for the guy who has to put up with her shrieking. He doubted that there would be any shrieking considering who she would be meeting with. If there was, he would be very interested to see what Liam did to the woman. We'll deal with that if it happens, Olin said. Let's get moving before it decides to rain on us. Think it will? Reed said, guess those clouds over the past don't look too promising. Olin's head turned as he followed Reed's gaze northward to the low pass dividing the Azalizian foothills in the east and the Manticore Mountains to the west. Most clouds emptied themselves north of the pass, but it wasn't uncommon to catch a bit of it on the other side. They boarded an old river barge loaded with grain from the harvest. The ship's crew pointedly avoided speaking with Olin and his men as they cast off and worked the sails to get underway. Liam picked out a spot on the barge's blunted bow, watching the shore as they sailed northward on the Senna. How long will it take to reach Beaumont? Liam asked. Usually takes around a day, Reed said. River's calm in the fall, but it'll get chilly once we cut into the mountains. 
you should relax while it's still nice. It doesn't seem very busy compared to the Ravenmark, Liam said. I saw a barge come down the valley every few minutes there. This place ain't nothing like the Ravenmark, Reed told the youth like we said yesterday, everything out of sight of the highway is basically a frontier. Could you start explaining that part to me now? The woodsman scratched his earlobe, staying silent until he eventually turned to look at Olin. How would you put it, Olin? Bloomrush is a house of petty men, Olin replied. They don't like challenges to their power, get jealous if others see any success, and love their luxuries. That's the way they rule their territory and that's the way it's always been. The barge's course took them up a large tributary, after which the scenery along the riverbanks drastically changed. As Reed had promised, gone was the patterned landscape of carefully cultivated farmland, replaced by the murk of impenetrable forests. Olin pointed at a wooden pier on the northern shore where a pair of boys were casting their fishing nets into the river. There's a village in the trees somewhere, he said. All that haze you see coming out of the woods comes from the colliers who live there. So it's a lumber village? More like a charcoal village, Reed said. That's all they're allowed to turn their timber into. The nobles and merchants tell us that fuel's always needed for the finery forges, but that's just a convenient excuse. The town does have a lot of refineries, Liam noted. Sure does, Reed agreed. Thing is that timber and charcoal are all we peasants are allowed to produce. Woodsmen collect wood. Colliers make charcoal. We can't clear land for farms or anything else. The mining villages have their own version of that. I've seen plenty of places that focus on what their land's good for and they do pretty well for themselves. Sure, Reed said. That might be true elsewhere, but it isn't here. Here, it's about control. People around here aren't allowed to grow food for themselves. If a village like this one we're going by does anything that the nobles don't like, then their grain shipments mysteriously stop. Same goes for a mining settlement. That means the lords only need to control the farmlands and the rivers to control the territory's whole population. But you said it's basically a frontier out here, right? Liam asked, can't villagers just hunt and forage? That'd be nice if it was the case, but the nobles know what they're doing. Each village only gets enough land to survive on by selling charcoal. You need a lot more than that to survive off of what nature provides. What about Estovas? There's a trick to that one, Reed replied. Well, a few tricks. Estovas only applies to tenants holding contracts with the local lord. Seasonal help that goes to the farms doesn't count as part of a tenant household, so those people don't qualify. The miners aren't tenants either, just laborers. As for the lumber villages, it's like I said just now. They may have a tenant's rights to Estovas, but, because of the way the land's partitioned, trying to claim that right costs you more than it gains. That's pretty messed up, Liam said. Don't tell me you haven't seen something like it before. I have, the youth admitted, but it's still messed up. You betcha. Places like this are perfect for us to recruit from. Is that how you guys ended up joining? Yep. Having a slice of land to call your own is nice and all, but, after getting kicked around for a bit, you start to realize that it's better to be the boot than the ass. Liam fell silent at Reed's response. He appeared to give the man's words plenty of thought, but those words were long-established common sense in the Azalizian marches. The strong did what they wished to the weak, escaping from under their heel meant joining those who could stand up to them. As Reed had mentioned, it was a great way for the Eight Fingers to recruit en masse. Of course, Many outlaw groups wouldn't readily submit to the syndicate's authority, so a bit of violent restructuring was a natural part of the integration process. As they closed on their destination, Olin rose from his seat, stretching his sore back as he joined Liam at the bow of the barge. The youth had continued observing the landscape on both sides of the river long after Reed and the others had wandered off to take naps on the deck. Liam, Olin said, we need to go over some things before we reach Beaumont. Liam put his clipboard away before looking up at him. Sure, he said. He still couldn't tell if the boy harbored any resentment over what had happened the previous day. Regardless, 
he would have to be careful with his words. Beaumont isn't like the towns on the highway, Olin said. Bloomrush's men don't bother coming out here unless there's a reason to. That means the local lords are used to having much more of a free hand around here than you've probably seen elsewhere. They're used to having their way with commoners and they don't react well when they don't get what they want, shouldn't they be out in their lands? The harvest should be the busiest time of the year for everyone, especially the nobles. You are not wrong, Olin replied, but these nobles are just a bunch of useless layabouts. They'd rather be in town drinking themselves further into debt than making sure their territories are running smoothly. That doesn't make any sense, Liam said. Happens anyways, Olin shrugged. Point is they're that sort. All pride and no money. No real power. They'll jump at the chance of earning clout amongst their peers. Strange young men with no allies make for perfect targets. It happened all too often. Even starving townsfolk coming through looking for work in the forests or mines were targeted. They were the ideal target, in fact. People like that were too weak to be a threat to a noble and their goons, plus they always carried a bit of money to cover their traveling expenses. Beating them up provided a boost to a noble's useless sense of self-worth and resulted in a free drink or two besides. The very last thing Olin wanted was for an agent from the sorcerer's kingdom to be attacked by a drunken noble and his attendants. Sending Reed and his gang ahead of them would probably prevent that from happening, but the Eight Fingers had been burned so many times by the sheer idiocy of the so-called Third Faction's members that he couldn't be certain. So, what do you think I should do? Liam asked, become a girl? Olin blinked at the unexpected option. You can do that. Maybe. It took less than half a second for Olin to conclude that it was a bad idea. The Eight Fingers had more than a few members who could disguise themselves as women, but it was almost exclusively used as an offensive option for good reason. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Olin said. They'd probably drag you off somewhere to be raped. I'll just avoid notice, then. No, you need to be seen by these guys. They probably won't give you any trouble once I make it clear who you are. I'm just worried they'll act on impulse before they recognize who you are. Recognize me, wait does that mean these are the nobles who are supposed to be on our side? The very same, Olin nodded. We've got thousands of those insufferable shit stirrers tucked away in places like this all over the kingdom. Towns like Beaumont are big enough to keep them distracted but too far away from anything important for them to cause any real trouble. As he considered how things would play out in the town, he wondered whether letting the nobles attack Liam was the better option. They would probably be killed for attacking an agent of the Sorcerer's Kingdom and the Eight Fingers would have that many fewer problems to worry about. Then again, letting that happen might be seen as an extension of the previous day's plotting, so he couldn't take that risk, a set of shallow rapids marked the end of the river's navigable run. Just before that point, the wooden piers of Beaumont jutted out into the water. A lone man stood at the end of the closest one, the light of his torch dancing over the dark waters as he signalled to them. Reed lit a torch and signalled back. Two dozen men armed with longbows emerged from behind the seasoned timber and sacks of ore piled across the wharf. Is that kind of security necessary? Liam asked. There haven't been river bandits around here since before my pa was born, Reed answered, but we do get merchants trying to do business without our go-ahead once in a while. So if they don't have your go-ahead, Liam said, they end up like yesterday's caravan? Huh? What do you mean? Speckled mare didn't like our new terms, Olin said. Ah, Reed nodded knowingly. Yeah probably something like that. Ship and cargo get seized. Crews ransomed or sold off. Nobles pretty much do the same thing, you don't have nobles where you're from? We do, but operating without a license usually only results in a fine. I guess smuggling can earn the death penalty, but only for the really bad stuff. Huh, Reed grunted. Well, smuggling something like food makes it harder to control the people makes anyone who tries to do it the same as a rebel. I guess you could frame it like that. Once again, Liam didn't look too impressed with what he had gathered from the exchange. 
his soft behavior caused Olin to once again consider finding a few women to attend to him. If he could convince Hilma's people to send someone skilled over, they could probably gain all sorts of useful information. Read, the man on the pier with the torch called out to them, who's that you got with you? Take a guess, Reed replied with a smirk. The man squinted in the darkness as the barge closed with the pier. Olin? The one and only, Olin said. You son of a goblin, the man, an acquaintance by the name of Francis, spat. I should drown you in the river here and now. Along the wharf, low voices from the bowmen rose in agreement. Olin chuckled, ignoring their threats as he stepped past Francis onto the pier. I'd love to trade banter about bygone days, Olin said, but we're here on business. This young man is Liam. He works for our new patron, the same patron who's helping us staff the mines. One by one, the men's faces drained of color as they realized who they were dealing with. Francis offered an awkward bow as Liam disembarked. Welcome to Beaumont, Mr. Liam. Just Liam is fine, Liam said. Olin said that a few people around here might take offense to a stranger getting special treatment. Why you're exactly right, Francis nodded. Your understanding's a real help. Where are those idiots now? Olin asked, Veer in the manticore, as usual, Francis answered. It's an hour after supper, so they should be halfway to piss drunk. Olin sighed and scratched his head. He couldn't even arrange for a proper introduction without having someone puke on Liam's boots. How about the Countess? She's in her manner, Francis replied. Also as usual. The only time we see her is when she summons someone to scream at. Sounds like we should skip the both of them, Reed said. Will they be any better in the morning? Liam asked. Depends if you like them drunk or cranky. I'll deal with them in the morning. Liam said. How far are the mines from here? They're all over this side of the mountains, Francis said. Traveling at night's just asking for it, though. We've got all kinds of nasties out there. Then I guess I'll see how things work around town, Liam said as he stepped out of the path of a dock worker. Does all this grain go into the town's granaries? Or is it redistributed somehow? Francis sent a confused look at Olin and Reed. It wasn't exactly a question one expected from an agent of the Kingdom of Darkness. It's, ah, both, I guess. Francis said, villages trade their exports for grain and everything's delivered on a schedule. I don't know much about the particulars, the merchants and nobles take care of that. How can the nobles take care of that if they're drunk? I don't know much about the particulars, Francis shrugged. I guess I'll leave that for tomorrow too. Liam muttered. How about we settle in for the evening? Reed suggested, night gets a lot colder up here. Francis and I can get you up to speed over supper. Fine, Liam sighed. Try not to get too drunk this time. Francis, Reed, and his gang shared a chuckle. Reed clapped Liam on the back and led him away from the waterfront. Olin fumed silently as he followed behind them. The local syndicate members were clearly trying to monopolize Liam's attention and Olin didn't have the resources on hand to do anything about it. He would have to call for reinforcements from the city to deal with the growing problem. Their group narrowed into a single file procession as they made their way higher into the town. A familiar expression filled Liam's face as he stared down at the waterlogged ruts in the road. Is this a street or a stream? I know it looks bad, Francis said but it's surprisingly handy. How so? Liam asked. All the garbage and horse shit gets washed into the river every time it rains, Francis answered. Smells way better than most places. It'd be better if you had paved roads and proper drainage, Liam said. Francis' sharp laugh bounced off of nearby buildings. Yeah, right. Liam, let me tell you a story. A few years ago, some fancy fellows from the royal court came and said the same damn thing. Even managed to convince the old count to buy in on their ideas, they paved the town's roads and all of the main routes going up into the mines. Sure doesn't seem that way, Liam said. It did back then. 
smooth cobblestone lanes stretching up into the passes and beyond. Cost Lord Beaumont a pretty penny, but the advisers from the royal court told him that it was an investment. That he'd make his money back in a decade or so. As you can see, those advisers were talking out of their asses, and the Count was a fool to listen to them. What happened? Nature happened. It rains in these mountains for half the year. There's snow in the winter. The royal court's fancy roads broke apart in no time and there was no way that the local lords could afford maintenance. Those idiots from the capital came in acting like they knew better than anyone else, but the only thing they managed to do was ruin everyone and everything with their big talk. Are you sure you guys aren't just cursed? Liam asked, the more I hear about this place, the more it feels like someone's been forcing you people to make the worst decisions whenever possible. It feels that way sometimes, Francis answered, but, as you can see, we've been able to make the most of it. And it's not like it's all bad, yeah? Our minds have been turning a tidy profit since we switched over to the new, um, labor. That's good to hear, Liam said. I still have to visit them, though. And we will, Reed said as they walked under the sign of the nearest tavern. Tomorrow. Tonight, we drink, I don't get it. Liam frowned at the men lining both sides of the table. A full third of them had passed out while the rest were somewhere between senseless and comatose. He eyed the liquor swirling in his cup, it was some sort of wine that tasted more like vinegar, wondering how the eight fingers managed to get anything done. While he worked, they just followed him around, chatting, giving passers-by threatening looks, and even sleeping when they could get away with it. Once the day was over, they acted as if they had just done a hard day's work, which was rewarded by a hearty meal and plenty of drink. Of course, this was only his second day with them, but they were so matter-of-fact about it that it had to be routine. I can't believe you drank Francis' gang under the table. He looked over his shoulder, finding a buxom blonde barmaid standing behind him. The pub had four such barmaids and none of the female staff were over twenty. He wasn't sure he wanted to know what happened to the ones who got too old. I'm pretty sure they did most of the drinking, Liam said. Sorry for the trouble, Claire. Oh, it's no trouble at all. Claire offered him a brilliant smile, well, it's more that this is pretty normal. Liam rose from his seat at the head of the table, disentangling Reed, who had attached himself to his ankle. That's pretty amazing, Liam said. How much will this run us? Claire's smile wavered at his words. What do you mean by that, sir? Um, how much do we need to pay? That's, Jay, just a moment. With a swirl of her shortened skirts, the barmaid disappeared into the kitchen. A few minutes later, she re-emerged with the pub's owner. The willowy man, who doubled as the establishment's chef, kept wiping his hands on his stained apron as he made his way over. He then switched to dry washing his hands and his mouth seemed to be stuck twitching in a half-smile. Do you need a cleric? Liam asked. Uh? Uh, no. I, to make it clear, we're not demanding that you pay in any way. Beside the owner, Claire tearfully nodded. I, I didn't mean it, sir. Please. Wasn't I the one that brought it up? They were so desperately sincere that it made him doubt his memory. Groans rose from the table at the sudden outburst. Claire whimpered and hid behind the owner. Let's take this conversation elsewhere, Liam said. The two were quick to take him up on his suggestion, leading him to a narrow hall between a stairwell and the kitchen. Liam waited for them to say something, but they wouldn't even make eye contact with him. So, what's this all about? He asked. It's nothing. The owner said, nothing at all. Look, this is all a big mistake. We won't ask again. Just don't do anything. Please. I'm going to get mad if you don't answer my question. Claire and the owner exchanged a look. The barmaid let out a cry as the owner reached out and grabbed the base of her ponytail, forcing her head down. It's this stupid girl's fault. The owner said, she came in saying you wanted to pay. I did. She tricked you, the owner said. You and your friends don't need to pay. Do what you want with her, just don't burn down my pub. In no way, shape, 
or form did Liam imagine that trying to pay for food and drink would result in whatever the hell was happening in front of him? He grabbed the owner, squeezing his wrist to force his grip on the girl free. Don't make a scene, Liam said. Doesn't Claire work for you? Why are you treating her like this? Why? All right, just take her. Ha! Huh? The owner shoved Claire at him. Do whatever you want with her. Just leave me and my pub alone. Liam was left speechless as the owner fled into the kitchen. What did he hope to gain by running away? It wasn't as if he could escape if Liam felt like chasing him. A ragged sob dragged his gaze from the kitchen entrance to the girl in front of him. Are you all right? Liam asked. Another sob. One of the men in the common room started making noise, so Liam ushered Claire out of the hallway and into the alley behind the pub. The girl visibly tensed, clutching her skirts tightly as darkness engulfed them. She stumbled as soon as they started moving away from the door. Liam reached out to take her by the hand, reminding himself that humans normally didn't have dark vision. W. Wait, Claire said, it's not safe for me tonight. Don't worry, Liam said, I'll take care of you. His reassurances kept her quiet until they reached the end of the alley. There, Claire shrank away from dim light leaking from the bars and brothels along the street. Where are you taking me? The barmaid asked. Your place, I guess. Liam answered, you probably don't want to stay at work after what just happened. Claire nodded silently and slowly led him to the outskirts of Beaumont. The night's overcast skies lent little in the way of light. Eventually, Claire stopped again. It's too dark, she said. My lamp's still at the pub. Hold on, Liam told her. He reached into one of the pouches on his belt and pulled out a magic light. The crystal sphere only had two settings dash off and two bright dash so he wrapped it up in a sheet of paper before activating it. Claire stared, wide-eyed, at the magic item in his palm. We can talk when we get to your place, Liam said. Do you know where we are? Claire looked around for a moment before nodding. Liam followed her as she picked her way through the muddy lanes between the wooden dwellings crammed below the town's walls. They stopped at a set of buildings a few dozen meters from the town's western gate, this way, Claire said. She stepped into an alley that could barely be called one. It eventually opened up into a well-kept garden surrounding an old well. Ironically, someone had put in the effort to lay large cobblestones on the pathways, making the lightly traveled section of alleyway the only place Liam had seen in Beaumont that was somewhat paved. Claire knocked lightly on one of the doors surrounding the urban garden. A few seconds later, it opened a crack. The middle-aged woman within looked from Claire to Liam. He wanted to use the house, mother, Claire said. I see, Claire's mother replied. I'll prepare a bath for our guest. It's all right, Liam said. I don't need one. Then I'll wait outside. Why? The two women froze at his question. Several seconds passed before Claire's mother fully opened the door. Liam examined the building's interior as Claire led him inside. Like most dwellings in Re Estes's towns, Claire's home consisted of a single common room that measured less than five meters to a side. He and Say had lived in one such dwelling back before their mother had abandoned them. A sparingly fueled fire pit occupied the center of the floor, offering little in the way of light and warmth. Efforts to insulate the room with straw and scrap materials had been made, but the cold and damp still seemed to seep in from everywhere. A single wooden table with two stools sat under the home's only window, which faced the alley they had entered from. My bed is over here. Liam turned to find that Claire had shrugged off her kirtle and was fumbling with the buttons of her blouse he reached out and grasped her trembling hands. Stop, he told her. I'm not here for that. He sighed at her uncomprehending stare. I just wanted to ask some questions, Liam said. Most of what I know about this territory comes from those guys that I was with. A lot of it was hard to believe. Liam released Claire's hand and turned away. He scanned the house one more time before placing his magical light beside the fire pit, and then he pulled out a heating hoop. Warmth rapidly suffused the room once he activated it. 
Claire's mother looked around in wonder. Claire, she asked, who is this young man? His name is Liam, Claire answered. He's a wizard from the Eight Fingers. I'm a what? Why you're not? But you're casting magic. He had learned a few spells as an assassin, but saying so would probably cause more confusion. I'm using magic items, Liam said. These two here, anyone can use. Want to try? Claire and her mother violently shook their heads. He should have expected that response from two denizens of Rhea's eyes, especially since he had been one until just recently. Magic in the kingdom was only available to an exclusive few and the government as a whole did little to promote its growth. As a result, the common sense surrounding magic was founded upon ignorance, rumors, and superstition. Liam cleared his throat. Anyways, he said, I'm not a wizard and I'm not a member of the Eight Fingers. Then what are you doing with them? Claire asked. They, um, volunteered to show me around. I don't think I'm getting the whole story, though. Too many things don't make sense. But why ask us? Claire sat down on her straw mattress, we are nobodies. You live here, Liam replied. I want to know what you know. Claire's mother pulled out one of the stools, gesturing for Liam to take a seat. You seem like a nice young man, she said, but what will you do with what we say? Knowing things can be dangerous. I don't intend to tell the eight fingers if that's what you're worried about. What about the nobles? This information isn't for anyone around here, Liam said. If anything, it'll go towards improving things in time. Claire and her mother still appeared hesitant to cooperate. Unable to think of another way to convince them, he placed two silver trade coins on the table. Claire's mother sucked in a breath. Money is dangerous, she said. Liam silently conceded that it could be dangerous, but it wasn't as if he was offering platinum coins. Going by what he saw of the local prices, two silver trade coins could probably sustain a family in Beaumont for two weeks. Does that have something to do with what got you in trouble at the pub? Liam asked. No, Claire shook her head, that was because the eight fingers don't pay. They eat, drink, and sleep wherever they want. For free. The last place that defied them got burnt down. Everyone that worked there was killed and the owner was impaled on top of the rubble of his business. Does this happen to the other businesses in town, as well? It's all the same for everyone. There's a protection fee, too. For a house like ours, it's a silver a season. What about the guilds? Liam asked, I doubt they'd take this lying down. Claire's mother let out a bitter laugh. The guilds? The guilds were run out of town before I was born. If I remember correctly, my mother said that the guilds tried to resist by hiring mercenaries, but the mercenaries were killed and half of the town's artisans were slaughtered in retaliation. What about the nobles? What about them? Claire's mother snorted, they are just as helpless as the guilds. The eight fingers are parasites. Everything that they do comes at someone else's cost. You either learn to live with them around here, or you don't live at all. Liam shook his head as he recorded the woman's words. Trained as he was by Ijania, he knew all too well that it was easier to attack than defend. Unscrupulous organizations like the Eight Fingers had no desire to be competitive and showed no interest in self-improvement, they simply cut everyone down to a level where they could rule through fear and brute force. It didn't matter how much was lost so long as they stood on top. Reistise's most powerful individuals tended to become adventurers, so the kingdom was essentially doomed to be eaten from the inside out without foreign intervention. Have you noticed any changes in behavior from the Eight Fingers recently? Liam asked. Not really, Claire said. It's been the same people doing the same things until you arrived. You said just now that things might improve, is that true? I can't see how it could get any worse, Liam replied. I wouldn't expect things to change right away though. One more thing, do you know much about the local mines? I don't know much about mining, Claire said, my father works in the mines, but he only comes back once or twice a year. If that's the case, Liam said, why not move to the settlement where he works? Because there's barely any work for women up there, 
Claire's mother said. Here in town, we can at least make ends meet. Also, my husband not being around makes it convenient for some of what we need to do. I see, Liam said. Well, I think that's about all I wanted to ask. Thanks for helping me out. He rose from his seat, leaving the two silver trade coins on the table. After a bit of thought, he added a third. He didn't have anything against prostitution, but Claire was far too young. The money he left with her would help keep her out of it for a while. Are you sure you don't want to stay the night? Claire asked. Alarms sounded off in Liam's head. The girl's initially fearful tone had turned into a hopeful one that he was all too familiar with. What had he done to deserve it? Was it the money? Maybe mixing money with women led to problems. Sorry, Liam said, I got work to do. He gathered his things and hurried out the door, climbing to the rooftops before checking for tails. After waiting for a while for someone to enter his dark vision range, he decided he had gotten away clean. Aside from Olin, none of the Eight Fingers men seemed to carry magic items, never mind equipment that enhanced their senses. Now, where to next? With his mission having him cover a huge amount of territory, the time he had to gather information was relatively limited. Granted, his mission only required him to note the condition of Reestise's infrastructure and logistics, but Countess Wagner and Countess Corlin told him that understanding the inner workings of what he saw was just as important if not more so. The information that he gathered would be crucial to improving the area once the Sorcerer's Kingdom took over. The local nobles should have had a better grasp of the big picture, but the available prospects didn't seem very promising. They wandered around the town centre, boasting between themselves, harassing the citizenry, and drinking the surrounding establishments dry. Olin also said that they were being isolated to keep them from wreaking havoc with their antics, so any information that he did end up pulling out of them had a good chance of being skewed to the point of uselessness. Watching their drunken carousing in the streets from the rooftops didn't help improve Liam's opinion. He crossed his arms, staring across the rooftops as he considered his options. Wait, I don't need to see any nobles at all, do I? If he wanted information on territorial operations, all he had to do was sneak into the local manor, grab their records, and send them to the Sorcerer's Kingdom to be analysed by experts. He was no good at deciphering that stuff anyway and dealing with the nobles in the area seemed way too annoying. Shouts and jeers rose from below as two groups of retainers started a brawl in the middle of the street. Never mind annoying, he didn't think he would be able to get any work done with them at all. His mind made up, Liam left the commotion behind him, crossing over the rooftops on his way to Beaumont Manor. The estate has its own little section of the town that was walled off from the common district, effectively turning it into a modest castle. Unlike other estates he had visited in the past, however, this one was in a dire state of disrepair. The castle grounds were overgrown and its buildings looked like they hadn't seen any cleaning or maintenance for several seasons. Scattered groups of men acted as security, but they bore no discernible livery. He could only assume that the Eight Fingers had taken the place over to use as a base. Their security is full of holes, though. Liam made it into the estate without so much as a glance in his direction. Once he marked where all of the sentries were positioned, he made his way toward the large manor at the centre of the grounds. After looking through several dusty windows, he found a room lined with bookshelves. Flickering candlelight flowing from an unseen corner gave him pause, causing him to wait and observe its occupants. A few minutes passed with no movement on the inside, so Liam worked open the window latch and waited again. Again, there was no movement. Whoever was inside was oblivious enough to not notice the cold autumn air flowing in. He lifted himself onto the windowsill and carefully poked his head inside. The source of the candlelight was further away than he thought, a table at the end of a long row of bookshelves with a single figure hunched over it. He shut the window behind him and padded out of sight. The first bookshelf wasn't as well stocked as he imagined a library in a count's manner would be. Neither was the one opposite to it. He picked up a string-bound book and flipped through the pages. Poetry? He wasn't a bard like his sister, but even he could tell that it wasn't very good. 
the next few books were much the same. What were the chances that the entire library was filled with bad poetry? Maybe the nobles here encoded their records. The thought followed him as he crept over to the next set of bookshelves. He went over journals of hunting trips in the Manticore Mountains, accounts of travels to other parts of Riestais, and one trip to our winter. Most of the content focused on local art, music, and architecture, which was of little practical use to him. At least their records. Maybe the next row will have what I'm looking for. The next row of bookshelves turned out to be completely empty. Did they keep important records in another room? Just to be sure, he went to the table at the other end of the room to see what the figure was up to. Several stacks of books framed a tabletop strewn with documents. The figure turned out to be a young noblewoman wrapped up in several blankets. He could only assume that she was the Countess of Beaumont. Liam took a book from the table, immediately finding what he was looking for. He went through several more, which all turned out to be one sort of administrative record or the other. How many could he take before the noblewoman noticed that books were disappearing in front of her? This is impossible, the noblewoman moaned. A tear trickled down the countess cheek. Liam leaned in to see what she was crying over. She blinked up at him with a gasp. Shoo! The noblewoman made a weird sort of deflating sound as she fainted. She slid right out of her chair and smacked her head on the hardwood floor. Ow! Countess Beaumont rolled around on the floor, clutching the back of her head. Her layers of blankets came loose, revealing a slender figure in a somewhat plain nightgown. As far as noble women went, she had average looks, which was to say that most women couldn't hope to compete with her. Are you all right? Liam asked. It hurts, Countess Beaumont cried. I was trying to faint, but then this stupid floor hit me on the head. Right, I'll be going now. Wait. Who are you? I don't think I've seen you among those ruffians loitering in my estate. Liam considered his answer. He didn't want to deal with the local nobles because they all seemed useless, but Countess Beaumont looked like she was actually hard at work. My name is Liam, he said as he held out a hand to her. I'm an official from the Sorcerer's Kingdom. The Sork, do you mean to say that Lady Albedo sent you? But, but it's too soon. I haven't had the chance to do anything yet. I didn't know it was like this. I don't want to de. The noblewoman grew increasingly frantic as she spoke, breaking down into tears at the end. She sobbed pitifully, hiding her face in her hands. Um, I'm not here to kill you, Liam said. But why else would they send an assassin? I was sent to inspect a few things in the Azalisian marches, Liam said. You didn't deny that you're an assassin. Look, I need to collect some information and I figured you could help. Can you? Countess Beaumont lowered her hands and turned her eyes up at him. I can't promise anything, but I can try. In exchange, could you please tell Lady Albedo that I didn't know things had become like this? I'm trying my best, I truly am. You keep repeating yourself, Liam said. What are you panicking over? The, the, everything. The Countess shrieked, House Beaumont is ruined. Our fief is impoverished. My vassals are useless. I never knew about any of this. But this is your territory, Liam said. How could you not notice what's been going on? I lived with my mother at our manor in Re Bloom, Russia. My lord father never mentioned that we were experiencing any difficulties, financial or otherwise. He always told me not to worry about the domain and to keep refining myself for my fiancé. I got whatever I needed, so I never once doubted him. It wasn't until the title fell to me and I arrived in the summer that I started to uncover the truth. Liam scratched his head as the countess presented her predicament. He didn't know enough about nobles to decide whether she should share the blame for her family's failures or not. By her account, she was purposely kept ignorant of her family's troubles. Additionally, she had been kept far away from those troubles, unable to discern the truth for herself. Do you have any siblings? Liam asked. My brother fell in battle alongside my father, the countess answered. We weren't close. 
He left to serve as a page around the same time that I was born and only returned once a year to be seen with our Lord Father during the war with the Empire. I see. Then what do you plan to do now? Countess Beaumont snorted, her voice laden with bitter frustration as she replied. What can I do? It's an impossible situation, I tell you. Well, what were you doing just now? Trying to locate funds to hire adventurers, the countess replied. Winter is coming. The wildlife is moving down into the valleys and the things that prey upon it will surely come as well. House Beaumont needs to come up with a budget to contract security services, but we don't even have enough for a single copper rank commission. We can't even defend ourselves for a day, never mind an entire season. Never mind being ruined, we'll just all be eaten. Are you sure about that? Liam asked. What? Of course I'm sure. They're called the Manticore Mountains for a reason, those monsters will paralyze our iron shipments and what's left of the economy will collapse. Without the assistance of adventurers, the mountain tribes will drive us from our homes. We have no other way to prevent this. Doesn't Rhea Estes have some sort of subsidy for this sort of thing? Counts and above don't qualify, the young noblewoman replied. We are supposed to be prosperous enough to secure our fiefs and those of our vassals. Isn't House Bloomrush charged with a similar obligation? On paper, they are, the countess replied. In practice, Liam, you seem like an honest man. That's a rarity in the Azalizian marches. Knowing House Bloomrush, what will probably happen is they'll allow this county to collapse and then use it as evidence that House Beaumont isn't fit to rule. Only after I'm stripped of my titles will they send adventurers to clear out the territory, and then House Bloomrush will claim the land for itself. Ha, huh, Liam said. That sucks. Well, you won't have to worry about that. There's another way to do this. It seemed that she didn't know what the Eight Fingers were doing up in her territory's mines. Countess Beaumont reached up to grasp Liam's hands, fluttering her eyelashes up at him prettily. The loose neckline of her nightgown offered him an eyeful of her budding cleavage. Don't keep me in suspense, dear Liam, she breathed. Liam shook his hands free and took a step back, turning his attention to the books on the table. Ah, you're going to have to hold on to that thought, he said. I have to check with my superiors to see what I'm allowed to do.